I'm going to uh, introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, uh, Brent Hockaday is a trusted legal advisor and advocate for businesses and their leadership teams. Board certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization and Labor and Employment Law, company leaders including CLOs, corporate counsel, and human resource executives collaborate with Brent for strategic counseling, consulting, and litigation decisions. A substantial part of Brent's practice involves enforcing and defending against restrictive covenants with a heightened focus on the misappropriation of trade secrets and confidential and proprietary information. I'd also like to introduce Tammy Wood. She's the chair of the litigation section at Bell Nunnally. She has nearly 30 years of experience as a trial lawyer representing businesses in the areas of commercial and employment litigation. In addition to trial work, she also regularly consults with business clients on workplace issues, investigations, policies, and strategies for litigation avoidance. She's also a sta staunch advocate for diversity and inclusion in the legal profession as a mentor of the Dallas Bar Association's Women Empowered to Lead program and was recently honored by the Texas lawyer as one of, top, one of the top legal mentors in the state of Texas. With that, I'm going to turn the time over to Brent and Tammy. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Scott. And I'm very excited to be with you guys here this morning, uh, as is my partner, Tammy Wood. So what I want to talk about today is something that I think is going to be important to every one of your businesses. And it may not be the most important, but it's right next to that. And that deals with your information in your relationships, because we know that's what keeps, those are the juices that keep the businesses uh, going, along with employees and the like. Um, so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of walk through a little bit about a discussion of what the law is. Now I recognize I'm in a room full of lawyers, so there's probably a significant number of you, as well as you on Zoom, that probably have a familiarity or a general understanding of what some of these concepts are. But I think it's really important to kind of hone in on the basics just a little bit briefly because that'll allow you to have a little context as we go into some of the other issues that uh, we're starting to see both in the courts and then just the realities of the business world in light of hybrid and remote work, which I imagine every one of your organizations has experienced over the last two years. Um, and then what I wanna do, I kinda wanna finish with talking about what are some of the tips and takeaways that you can have going back to your business and when you're speaking with your business folks on things that you can do in order to preserve that information and protect those relationships. And I got the clicker working. So the first thing I think is really important for everyone to understand is why this is such a big deal. Now, the Commission on Theft of American Intellectual Property estimated that there is between 180 and 540 billion dollars worth of loss every year due to trade secret theft. Now, this number, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, of course, and this number also includes some foreign espionage. However, the, the point is, and the takeaway is, that trade secret theft and the inability to secure and protect information costs real money. And I left the site here, and I'm happy to send, I'm not sure if they send you the uh, PowerPoint slides, but I'm happy to send those to you if uh, you don't have those, so feel free to reach out. Um, if you take away anything today, this right here I think is an important North Star. It's what you need to know. When it pertains to information, there's two real big components. There's prevention, and then there's execution. Prevention meaning you have the measures in place and the protective mechanisms in place that allow you to secure your information. Because as I'm gonna talk about a little bit later today, one of the big shortfalls that I've seen with, whether it's clients I've represented or clients I've gone against, because I've been on both sides of this deal, is the inability to effectively employ reasonable measures to protect your information. And what that results in is a situation where somebody actually took information, but you may not have actual legal recourse, and that can be problematic. The second thing is the execution, and this kind of goes into the realities of the business. We can have the best written agreements, as many of you know, or the most robust policies in place that say we protect and do certain things with our information. However, if in practice that's not the case because things are flipping through flash drives or personal information, that also can be problematic. Now, and on the relationship side, when we talk about restrictive covenants, this right here I think is something that a lot of people have been attuned to for a while, but it's become even more important, 
I think, because of some of the developments we've seen in different states where you all may have operations, as well as some movement on the federal end, which I'll talk about uh, as well. And that really is key, is just be targeted and reasonable. And we'll, dis we'll discuss that. Um, as many of you know, some of the traditional ways that um, you guys protect information or preserve your relationships or through non-disclosure agreements. I have non-compete, non-solicitation agreements, but a lot of times those are provisions within the non-disclosure agreement. In addition to that, if you have some kind of invention or intellectual property agreement, um, these are the areas that I really want you guys to pay attention to because this is where I think you can help out a lot with the prevention in. Um, so what we'll cover, kind of a high level, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my partner Tammy Wood here is going to go over the applicable law. She's going to give you a primer on here's what the law is so you have a good, solid understanding as we discuss and go through some of these uh, updates that we've seen both in the reality of the working world as well as movement in different state legislatures. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the barriers to protection. I want to talk about whether you, when you have something done, whether you can enforce it in relation to the realities of the work, as well as some of the risks that we're seeing in a hybrid work environment. Everybody, everybody here, I assume, uses Zooms or Teams probably on a regular basis. I would, I would venture to guess 90 plus percent of you have probably been on at least one Zoom or Teams meeting this week. And I'm going to talk about some of the problems and pitfalls that you could come across, or at least the workforces that you support could encounter in dealing with Zoom and your confidential information. And then I'm going to also talk about some of these, uh, the movement for restriction on uh, restrictive covenants. And then finally, some tips that I have for you to do. And I'm also leaving a little one-page handout for everyone. So um, if you need a quick reference, I think that's something that's helpful. Um, and once you have the context of today, you'll be able to employ that in your, in your practices. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Tammy. Good morning. So I left Brent with the clicker because I will break it otherwise. All right, so um, let's head to the next slide. So I'm just gonna give you guys a little bit of a primer on the law. It's totally gonna be a refresher, I think, for most of you. This is a really high level discussion of just the basics. So um, we have the Texas Uniform Trade Secrets Act is our Texas law, also known as TUTSA, right? Um, and we've got, it's. Texas adoption of the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. And 48 states have adopted it. I think it's North Carolina and New York that haven't, but they have their own version that's super similar. Um, and the federal act as well, the Defend Trade Secrets Act of 2016. So if you, um, let's look at the first look at the, the state law. I want to go back just a little bit. So these, the requirements of the state law are laid out here. You guys can read them. Go ahead and flip to the federal, because I'm going to talk more about the federal. Um, the requirements of the federal law are right here, and you can read them. If you read them both side to side, you'd say they look almost identical, and that is the case. Um, and so thought is, is why have, why have the two? Um, why would you want to be in federal court versus state court? Well, the fact of the matter is, is you can be in you can pursue both at the same time. You can have a parallel action uh, in federal court that involves the state court claims. And from a strategic perspective, uh, why you might want to be in federal court over state court, if you're prosecuting the claim, you might want to look at it a little bit differently than if you're defending the claim. So um, you do have original jurisdiction in federal court for uh, a, a claim under, under um, the trade secret law in federal court. There is a little bit, of, there's an interstate commerce requirement that's not really very hard to meet, but from a litigation strategy perspective, what you might think about is in federal court, depending upon where you're, where you're at, um, you may have more sophisticated judges. You may have more of a likelihood to get summary judgment. Now, if you've got a case where you think you have slam dunk summary judgment and you're prosecuting the claim, you know, federal court might be where you want to be. If you have a case where 
you think summary judgment, if the other side files summary judgment against you, that could be a problem. Maybe you want to be in, in state court. Um, you, your federal courts are going to be a little bit more familiar with the complex discovery that's going to be involved in state in, in this kind of cases, especially if you're in a jurisdiction where you'd be filing in state court, where you're in courts that are maybe of general jurisdiction, where you have a judge um, that is going to be hearing criminal cases and family law cases and also your civil case. If you have an opportunity to be in federal court where you're going to have a lot of complex discovery, protective orders are going to need to be enforced um, and understood, maybe you want to be in, in federal court. And just the, um, the availability of summary judgment is, is huge and it just really depends upon the facts of, of your case. So this is something from a litigation perspective to, to keep in mind. All right. So um, both of these statutes we got the green and the red. So what's the import of the green and the red? First of all, from um, a plaintiff's perspective, if you're trying to enforce, uh, protect the rights of your business, just understand under, these, uh, under both of these statutes, um, it can be difficult to pursue a claim under these statutes because the definitions are very, uh, they, they're very robust, they have very complex requirements. Um, the green, and the, the green is the same for both the state or the federal, those are the things where you're, you're not probably gonna have trouble proving that in your case. Uh, we've got financial, business, scientific, you can read it. The green parts are the things where you're not gonna run into trouble. The red parts are where you're gonna face the challenges in your case. And Brent's gonna talk a little bit more about how you can meet those challenges, or if you're defending against a claim, what you're gonna to wanna to hit on to win the case. Um, because if you can't prove that you took, for example, reasonable measures to keep the information secret, and Brent's gonna talk about how you do that, then you can't prove your case, your trade secrets case, under the state law, or under the federal law. So you may have the most secretive material, but if you don't treat it as secret, you're not gonna be able to, per, to prevail on one of these claims. Um, so super in, important is really the, the measures, and he'll talk about this, the, the secrecy measures and how you, how you deal with that, especially in this environment where we've got people who are um, not working in the office. All right, you wanna to go to the next slide? All right, so we've got the trade secret law, and then aside from that, there's just straight up confidentiality. So go to the next slide. And confidential, confidential um, information, it's basically going to be governed by contract. You have your confidentiality agreements. There are some situations where you have uh, high-level executives or people who have fiduciary duties where there could be, without a contract in place, they have uh, requirements to maintain confidential information, but it really is a result of conf it's a confidentiality agreement. Um, important to note that you might have something in a confidentiality agreement that you say is confidential, that doesn't mean it's a trade secret. Two separate things. And also, just because you say it's confidential in your confidentiality agreement, it doesn't necessarily mean that the court's going to agree with you on that point. Again, they're going to look at some of the other factors that we talked about, or we'll talk about, with respect to trade secrets on, did you keep it confidential? Is this stuff that really fits the definition of confidential under the law? Is it public, is it public knowledge, um, that, that type of thing? Okay. All right, so now just quick to the non-competes. Um, we're all familiar with non-competes. We've all had uh, experience with them. I was taught, when Brent and I were talking about this presentation, I was telling him, I said, my very first year in law school when we had legal writing, I remember our, pro uh, our, our problem was a non-compete case, and we dealt with uh, DeSantis versus Wackenhut. Um, and it was super important, super new then, and it's, it's still here, 30 years later, I'm, I'm still talking about, about non-competes. So non-competes, uh, they've evolved over time, but the general requirements have kind of stayed the same, and here they are. So um, it's got to be ancillary, ancillary or part of an otherwise enforceable agreement. So we're talking about uh, it's got to be part of an employment contract. It's got to be part of a non-disclosure agreement, something that is an otherwise enforceable agreement. It can't just be a non-compete, a standalone. That's not really going to work for you. And then um, as far as 
sort of the consideration part, it's got to relate to a legitimate business interest. So I can't just throw money at you. It's got to be I'm giving you some sort of um, I'm giving you confidential access to confidential information that you wouldn't otherwise have. I'm giving you special training that you wouldn't otherwise have. I'm giving you special um, stock or other types of things that you wouldn't otherwise have um, that the company says you have a legitimate business that they, the company has a legitimate business um, interest in, right? So um, just money doesn't, doesn't cut it. I've had some people say, oh, I can just add on an extra $10, $100, little bonus. That's, that's really not going to work for you. Terms have got to be reasonable as to time, geography, and scope. So let's not have one that lasts forever or that lasts for more than a couple years. In some instances, it could be just a, you know, six months would be reasonable. It really just depends upon the type of business that you're involved in, uh, the, the employees that we're talking about, and then geography. Are you going beyond, is your agreement going beyond the, the office where your employee worked? Uh, the customers that they connected with, is it worldwide? Um, I've seen some non-competes that talk about uh, our current businesses that we're involved in and any future businesses that we are contemplating going into at the time you sign this agreement. That's probably not gonna work for you. Um, you know, unless maybe that, that employee had specific personal knowledge of what the company's business plans are. But for the average person, it probably wouldn't work for you. And, and just the scope, what can, what can they do? Um, and who, who can they do it for? So you gotta keep those terms reasonable and just be really, Brent could talk about, he's gonna talk about this a little bit more about just sort of the overreaching. We understand the sort of the attractiveness of, especially for you companies that have businesses in, in multiple states, um, to have a one-size-fits-all that you can send out to your HR team and they can sign up people um, as they're hired on. But just understand there's some risks in doing that because one size um, doesn't fit all. It really, you, you can run some risks there. So you really are better served to really tailor it to the employee, to the jurisdiction, um, and then go with it that way. All right, so. That's your high-level overview. I'll turn it back to Brent. Thank you, Tammy. Um, so what I want to talk a little bit about is some of these barriers to protection. And I think that's going to be the most important thing for you guys to digest because you all have robust policies and procedures in place that deploy these agreements and the like. But where it becomes trouble is when you're actually trying to enforce them and make sure the stuff's there. So some of the big areas that I think are important to focus on when we're looking at what I call good but not good enough, um, I wanna look at information first with the trouble with the NDAs. I often see a lot of agreements, whether it's on an opposition or where I'm representing, where you have simply a copy and paste kind of form. Now that's fine for a starting point, but the problem with that is often the language doesn't, re doesn't reflect the realities of the business. So what do I mean by that? I may say that you are prohibited from using or disclosing any information which I deem confidential. And if you look at section 2.A, that definition is a paragraph long and you can't use that outside of the company. Perfectly fine. The problem is, is when we look at their sales team, they're constantly putting it on flash drives, they're sending themselves Gmail, they're sending some of that information out to prospective clients because they want it, they want it as fodder to explain why they should hire them, right? You just say, look who else I'm doing business with. Here's a list of clients that call me whenever they need my widget or they need my service. That's great because that helps the business. However, if you're trying later on down the line to enforce something against that employee because there's a violation of a non-disclosure agreement, that could be problematic. So really, it's, you guys are in a real tough position because there's no real easy answer with balancing the goal of helping the business succeed, administrative ease, but also enforcement on the end. So it's important to really understand the nuance here so you can navigate and put yourselves in the best possible position because nothing's 100-0 in this world. Um, Another big problem that I'm seeing is these are part of the original packets that are distributed and forgotten about. And the reason why this is problematic is because a lot of the workforces don't know that they're subject to these. I was helping an executive friend of mine uh, who was part of a reduction in force recently, 
and we were walking through some of the paperwork, and one of the questions that I posed to this person was, do you, are you subject to a non-disclosure agreement or non-compete? Do you want me to look at that? And this person was like, I think so, but I'm not sure. And this is a high-level executive, somebody who was in a very tight control group that was making very important decisions. And lo and behold, this person searched their, <laughs> searched their Gmail and found it from five years prior, and I took a look at it. And it dawned on me that this is not a unique situation to this person. How many other people have get hired to a job, they get a boatload of paperwork, they sign everything at the beginning, and then they forget about it? So one of the things that I think becomes problematic then is the employee forgets about it, doesn't know the employee's subject to it, and then the employee leaves, and there's not a real clear-cut answer of what is confidential and what isn't, and they assume they can take information with them. And there, there becomes kind of a disconnect. And I think if there are specific systems in place and you identify what is and isn't, and there's an awareness on the other side, I think you minimize your opportunity of people walking off with your stuff. So, uh, and then the other big thing that I'm seeing right now is remote and hybrid work. Show of hands, who's workforce is hybrid or remote. That looks like about everyone, or close to it. If I missed one, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so right then and there, you have people that aren't working on your company network. You have people that are using at-home Wi-Fi that probably doesn't, isn't subject to security. Now, they probably have a VPN or remote login, which adds to that, which is great. But these are just kind of risk factors. And the, the ability for you to monitor and control what, how they're transferring information and how they're moving things back and forth, what they're saving to personal devices is limited considerably, I think, with that. But you have to face the realities of the, of the day. You, you know, in two years from now, we may decide that remote work is not what, we, what it was cracked up to be and everybody's back in the office. But for a vast majority, I can see this being the new future. So you have to learn to adapt to it. So one of the things that is transferring information outside of company networks, and I'm gonna talk about that. There's a case that really kind of deals with Zoom um, but how that can be problematic if you're trying to enforce a trade secret protection after the fact. Uh, the same thing was with storage, as I just touched on. Um, I see many non-disclosure agreements every week that say, you cannot store my confidential information or this which I consider to be a trade secret, my pricing model, my client list, whatever, you, whatever have you. And those things are housed on, you know, everybody's personal hard drive, one drives are another problem. So it's, there, there's, there's, a, there's a gap between what we say and how it's played out that I'm seeing common. And this is with companies of all sizes. So nobody's, there, it, there's not really a pattern, at least that I've seen with that. And then finally with video conferencing, who, I actually, I'm curious, has everybody in here been on at least one Teams or Zooms, or Zooms, one team or Zoom call this week? Probably, yeah, at least definitely this month. So one of the things that I'm going to get into uh, on the next slide uh, deals with a case out of Delaware, actually. But these are starting to percolate throughout the country. And that is what information is being conveyed over Zoom, especially when you're dealing outside of the company. And we're going to talk about some of the issues that this court pointed out. And really what it did was it took an existing legal framework and just applied it to you know, the present day mo modern time. And a lot of times I think, you know, because of whether it's frustration or just wanting to be quick and easy with it, we don't think about that when we're going through there. So I'm going to talk about the Smash franchise case. So very high level, what this case involved was a franchisor who was selling franchisees, okay? And if you were a prospective investor, they wanted to hear from you because they were just trying to move their franchise around. And one of the things that they would do is say, if you are interested, let us know, and we'll put you on a Zoom. And then we'll tell you all the information you need to know. We'll give you lists of people who've used us before. Here's our, here's our strategy. Here's where we're looking to grow, what regions we're going to go to. And lo and behold, there was a group of not so honest folks, um, well, I'll let you determine that if you read the case, but who went to this meeting, said, that's a pretty good idea, but I don't need your model to do it. So they took that information and started their own. So they find out there's litigation ensues, and it really comes down to this issue on Zoom. Now, I quoted a couple, I, I picked a couple quotes out of this case. One was, assuming for the sake of the analysis that 
Smash had protectable trade secrets, it didn't take reasonable steps to protect their secrecy. So if you recall from a few slides ago, uh, we highlighted in red reasonable measures. That was really the thing that the court honed in on was reasonable measures. And this is Delaware, so it was dealing with Delaware statute, but the Uniform Trade Secrets statute, uh, all that, it, it's consistent across the board. So there's not, there's not much variation or deviation from that. And if you're not taking reasonable measures, it's gonna be hard after the fact when somebody's taken something from you, even if it's morally wrong, it may not be legally wrong. And I just, some of the high points here, they freely gave out the Zoom information where they conveyed this information. They used Zoom, the same Zoom meeting code. How many people use the same Zoom meeting code because they have a standard, you know, stock default Zoom program, if you will. Um, did not require participants to use a password, so there was no kind of protection gate in place. One of the things that I tell people don't discount is the use of passwords. I had a case recently, we, it was an injunction that wound up going to arbitration, and we had, it was a big, probably week and a half, two week arbitration at the end of the year, and password protection played a key role in that in the determination of what reasonable steps were taken. And that right there is a very important thing that a lot of people I don't think discount. We take for granted when we log into our laptops every day, there's a password, you probably, everybody in this room probably has four passwords they have to enter before they actually get to what it is they're trying to do. So the password protection is something that's key. And these Zoom meetings where they were giving, they were, they were relaying pretty you know, strategic information to third parties had no protection layer in that, and that was a really important factor. Um, another thing was they didn't have a waiting room feature to screen participants, so it was effectively an open door, anyone coming in off the street, and, or the virtual street, if you will. And then they didn't follow their own procedures, and they didn't have these third parties sign NDAs. One thing that I have that I have not seen as much of, I'm sure a lot of businesses do this, but I think it would actually be helpful to them, is if you are in a position where you're trying to elicit investors or you're listening or people uh, you're wanting people to buy your product or come in and it's and it's something that you guard or value to a level where you don't want the outside of the competition to know either about what you're talking about or what you're saying is to consider a non-disclosure agreement with a third party and I recognize there's a little bit of a it's got like a prenup feel it's kind of takes the love out of it but Depending on, depending on the circumstance, it may pay dividends in the long run. So you don't, you're not in the situation of this franchisor. So it's something to consider. And then of course at the bottom of the quote is because Smash didn't take reasonable steps to protect its trade secrets, hasn't established a reasonable likelihood of success in the merits, so then no injunction issued. So they're basically free to compete and do whatever they want. And as everybody in this room knows, if you're a business that's trying to protect your information, that can be devastating. And then you're looking at litigation expense onward. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about, let me make sure I didn't skip one. Yeah, some of the trouble ahead that I'm seeing in restrictive covenants. And this I think has been a long time coming because quite frankly, a lot of organizations, not every organization, but a lot of organizations have gotten too aggressive with it. And what we're seeing, and what everybody's seeing just turning on the news, is there's a pushback from the labor world. Um, not only with conditions and you know, pay disparities and the like, but there's this real solid movement against this idea of you prohibiting me from taking advantage of my, my abilities and finding the best deal out there. And it's the, these non-competes are crippling people, especially those that are in the lower income brackets. And we're, we're, what I'm seeing is states across the country, I have clients who have operations in different states, and they're wanting to deploy the same non-compete that may be okay in Texas or Florida, which actually allows quite a bit of leeway, in a state like Colorado now, which basically limits it only to executives, or a state like Illinois, which has income caps, where they won't let you non-competes at a certain level and at a higher level non-solicits, where there's these minimum thresholds and requirements for you to even enter that. And the problem with that, I think, a lot of it is these aren't targeted. As Tammy mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, there's, this, there's this battle between administrative, needing to be administratively efficient and ease on your workforce with also the idea of if something bad happens, you want to be able to enforce it. 
And what, what I tell people all the time is, I totally understand and I get where you're coming from. And for the vast majority of workers, especially on the non-disclosure side of it, you really can have something uniform. Most courts are gonna kind of say, yeah, that's your information. As long as you're, as long as you're walking the walk on the back end, we'll give that to you. The real, the real harm comes when you have these restrictive covenants that aren't targeted. And one of the things that I'm constantly hearing is, I get it, but we're not probably gonna enforce every single one. We're not in the business of litigating. We're in the business of doing whatever our business is and we wanna protect our information. But we want our employees to know that they can't just go walk across the street. Now, that's fine. The problem, though, is when you do have that one that does walk across the street and is a bad actor, and then you're stuck with this agreement that arguably isn't enforceable. And I'll tell you this, in, De in Texas, and I see this in other states too, there is a very sharp defense sword that you have if you are trying to knowingly enforce an overbroad non-compete. And you could be doing something that is probably wrong, but if they are knowingly trying to enforce an overbroad non-compete, they can get their attorney's fees. And I've used that on the defense side, and it is an incredibly effective sharp tool to bring them to the other side of the table and leverage something. And it's something I've been mindful of whenever I'm pursuing these. So that's why I think really taking the time and being thoughtful with who you're targeting and what you're doing and being reasonable with it is so important. Because there will be somebody who does do something and you wanna make sure that you have something with teeth. Um, I talked about state laws. The other thing too that's really interesting that I'm seeing, and there's nothing imminent on this, but I think it's important for everyone to know that this is out there in the ether. And depending on the way elections roll, whether it's the midterms this year or two years from now, um, this could be something that is, is real. And that is the federal approach to try to uh, regulate non-compete agreements. I would respectfully characterize it as hostile to non-compete agreements. Um, not so much with non-solicits, but definitely with non-competes, and I'll explain why when we look at some of the language. So here are just some examples of the state limitations that I touched on. California's been this way for a while. They effectively outlawed non-competes outside of the sale of a business. Um, usually it's an investor situation. This Colorado, Oregon, and Nevada are new ones. Nevada, I have a client that has a big operation in Nevada, and they have a lot of hourly workers. And when I, when I started working with them, they had these pre-existing non-disclosure agreements that had non-solicitation provisions on them. And I had to basically tell them, I don't think, I go, this is really tailored to non-compete, but it's unclear whether you're gonna be able to enforce any of these. And that's because they were paid on an hourly basis. So these legislatures are becoming attuned to the idea of competition restricting employee mobility, which suppresses wages. So as a result, they're putting laws in place that say you can't enter that. And in the case of, I believe, Colorado, you can actually get penalized, or excuse me, it was Illinois, it's not on here. Uh, Illinois will actually penalize the employer for trying to do it too. And it's a more, it looked like a sharper tool, a sharper sword than what Texas has on the defense end. So it's something to be very mindful of, especially for those of you who have operations outside of Texas, is really pay attention to that. So I mentioned this federal hostility, my words. Um, here's just a little snippet of what we're looking at. So two things happened last summer. I did this, I did a presentation before the State Bar where we really kind of focused just on this stuff, but I want to highlight it here because one of the things that every workforce does to protect its information is to have these restrictive covenants. A lot of the source of the information comes from the people. You want to make sure that you're protecting that, right? So last summer in July, there was an executive order issued, and earlier in the year, the Senate uh, it's still in committee, I believe, but there was a bill that was written related to the federal regulation of non-compete agreements. And here, basically, what uh, the administration did was they issued an executive order that encouraged the FTC to curtail the use of non-compete clauses and others that may unfairly limit worker mobility. I didn't pull the, the quote out for this presentation, but in my last one, they, there's a line about, there's a, there's a good series of sentences that kind of clues you in on what this administration, how it, how it views non-compete agreements. And it's pretty aggressive. We're saying it is, they have intentionally suppressed wages and they're bad for the economy. That's, that's the key takeaway. So you have a regime currently in place that is hostile towards that. The second thing is uh, the timeline on here. You know, there's no immediate effect on this, but it's something I think to be, to be aware of. Um, the legislative action, there, this isn't the Senate bill, it's Senate Bill 483, Workforce, Workforce Mobility Act of 2021. 
Um, it's not the first one. I believe in the mid-teens there was a, another one that was, uh, that was put together, but it, I don't believe it made it outside of committee. But here, as you can see, um, income brackets. The focus here on this is income brackets. They were, the federal government is really looking at who, is, who should be part of a non-compete. And quite frankly, while I represent businesses, I certainly understand where they're coming from. Not everybody needs to be subject to a non-compete. If you've got an hourly worker, you've got somebody that's lower on the pay scale, it doesn't behoove you any. And nine times out of 10, it's not gonna make business sense for you to spend the money that it would take to restrain them from doing that. So really being targeted, I think, is, I think is important. So here are the, here's some of the highlights of the Workforce Mobility Act that I wanna, I wanna just show you, assuming this goes through. It would limit non-competes to narrow circumstances where it's effectively the sale of a business or dissolution of a partnership. You're limited only to the specific area where they did business, and you have to be a senior executive official. And the definition, as I put in there, of senior executive official, uh, again, highest 10% of compensation rate, and it's got to be part of a severance agreement limited to one-year time period. So it's not going to be your typical for a year, for 12 months, 24 months, you can't engage in, or work or be a significant investor in any company that performed the services, however you define the services, within 10 miles, per se. That's under, under this federal rule or federal law that is currently in committee, uh, that's, that's where the movement is. And I checked it la uh, last week. It looked, I didn't see any movement on it, but that's subject to change. I put the link in the slide too for you to look at it, um, obviously, and stay abreast of it. So, so what, are, what are some of the solutions? I've kind of talked about really on the problem, but I want to talk about what takeaways that you guys can have when you're going back to your businesses, when you're either designing your agreements, you're reconsidering your agreements, or you're looking at your overall workforce and auditing the, the processes of how they go to minimize risk. The first thing I said, I remember, I remember that big slide I said at the beginning, this is North Star prevention execution. Here are the prevention thing. I think one, it wouldn't hurt if you haven't done it recently is to look at, take a look at your policies and your agreements. Do they match the business realities? Were these put together in 2019 before COVID, before anybody knew what a hybrid work environment was, before anybody really knew what Zoom was, although I think it's been out for a while? Um, limit who has access to what. If you're gonna really call something a trade secret and really want it to be protected, I think you have to take a scalpel approach. I think, you really, I think it's really beneficial to look at who needs to have access to this information. It's one thing to say everything's confidential and all my employees have access to confidential information. But if you really want something to be a trade secret because it has that level of value, it can be a challenging hill to climb if everybody in the organization, and especially some of your organizations have tens of thousands of people, have access to it. So really take a, take a, take a detailed look at that. The other thing is training. I think I have deposed several people who have left companies, taken information, and they're really befuddled as to why they're sitting there. They're like, I don't get it. So-and-so took this when they left. I did the same thing, but because I'm a top 10 salesperson, they're coming after me. Well, that may be true um, as far as motivations are concerned. The fact of the matter is that person didn't know because that person didn't have an idea. They didn't know what was confidential. They signed a 10-page document when they started and then five years later left and forgot all about it. So one of the things that I think would actually be beneficial to a lot of organizations is when you're doing your new hire training, when you're doing your EEO, your this is how you log into the computer, this is how we, this is why we wear this shirt on Fridays, that kind of stuff. I think it's really helpful to include a session or just a piece on what is confidential information and why it's so important. Because I'll tell you why, when you do have that bad actor and you're having to prove your case, in front of a judge, say three years from now, you can say, judge, not only, or trying to, to try to get an injunction, not only did I have this, the perfectly written non-disclosure agreement, not only did I have everything password protected, not only did I have retina scans just to get into the room, but I also walked them through what is and isn't okay. And that right there is gonna be pretty effective evidence of you taking reasonable measures to protect. Um, the second thing is execution, and this has to do really with just the realities of the work. Make sure your people are walking the walk. And I know that's hard to do, especially when you have larger workforces and they're dispersed in different places, and especially if they're remote. But the biggest takeaway that I have 
for that would be to really make sure your managers are aware of what's doing. Because really they're your eyes and ears on the ground. Whenever I'm representing a client and I want to know, and it deals with a, somebody who's not like at the executive level, I always talk to the manager because they know they're the ones, they're the voice uh, and the connection between where the corporate office is and where the people out in the field are. And so I think that's really important. And a lot of managers, I think, need to know. It's not okay to say, oh, just not a big deal. Just, yeah, just save it there. I don't care. This, that, or the other. When they do that with one person, it may affect something else in the future. And I think having an eye towards the big picture and understanding how these things can play out is very important. Um, I mentioned earlier on NDAs. Uh, I, I really think if you're going to be, especially, I see this with sales roles more often. Um, you know, not an initial meeting, not grabbing drinks, taking someone to a game or something like that. But if, you're, if, you, if you have a business where your sales team is selling something complicated or it's highly technical and it's, it's through a, you know, a significant RFP process or one which requires a lot of back and forth and they want to see information, if you're not doing this already, I would strongly encourage you to look at doing non-disclosure agreements, especially if you're going to give some information out that could be confidential or maybe even trade secret. Even then, that makes it tough because you got to really keep that in-house. But those right there don't discount them. And you, can, and you can draft them in such a way that aren't scary where a reasonable, respectful business isn't going to you know, balk at it. They would look in and say, yeah, totally get it. Um, so that, I think, is a good takeaway. The other thing, too, is restricting device usage. If you really want to keep something in-house, don't allow people to put it on their flash drives. Don't send, store things on Gmail, OneDrive, that. If, you, if you're going to allow it, that's okay, but just recognize your ability to say that it's confidential information is minimized, and especially trade secret. You probably, lost, you probably lose out on that argument. So it's just something to be aware of that um, a lot of times organizations, especially large organizations, that never comes up until it does. Until you have the bad actor or something comes up, you don't ever, you, you realize, oh wait, I've been doing this all along. So, Now's the best time, assuming none of you have bad actors at the moment that you're, that you're dealing with. Um, and then, of course, the retrieval of information where they access it. Um, with restrictive covenants, I think the solution is key, just like I said on that North Star slide, targeted and reasonable. Really identify what class of workers or what group of workers is appropriate for a restriction. Here's the other thing, too. You can have someone subject to a non-solicit but not a non-compete. I don't care if you go work for the other side, just don't take my information and don't take my people and don't take my customers. That's, an, that's kind of a middle ground that people can do. And I don't want to discourage people from having non-competes because they are enforceable and in certain roles they are important, but I think it's important to take a real good inventory of who's going to be subject to it and consider, let's play out worst case scenario. I don't want to be chicken little and the sky's falling, but if something did happen, could I enforce this? And if the answer is no, then I think you're putting yourself up for a big risk by having a one-size-fits-all to everybody. So really be tailored with that. Um, Non-solicits, I think, are really important, especially if you have a sales force or somebody that's engaging in these kind of relationships. That Courts typically are going to be go along with that so long as you're reasonable. Um, avoid. I would avoid industry-wide bans. You know, if you're in a hyper niche industry and there's like five of you in the world, you know, maybe under those circumstances something broader could be enforceable, but most courts are not going to be as inclined to keep people out of work. So industry-wide bans. I saw, I looked at one last, just last week that was for a mid-level employee, 45 miles or 50 miles from where they worked or the business was considering doing operations at the time of termination. I don't know how that person wouldn't even know where that is, and that would be effectively <laughs> everywhere there's a pro sports team. So be, be very mindful and targeted with and reasonable where, where you're trying to do your restrictions. Um, and I, you know, one of the, the, safest, the safest starting point is, unless you're in a smaller organization, then you probably are gonna get a little bit more bandwidth, but try to avoid situations where you have um, you, can't, you can't solicit any employees of the company or anybody who I've ever 
the company's ever sold to. Oftentimes, courts are going to want that to be a little more tailored, limited to people who you actually sold to while you were there, employees with whom you actually worked, especially if you're in a large organization with potentially 100,000 plus employees. That's, that's, going to be very, that's going to be very tough to enforce. And as I mentioned earlier, um, when you have the bad actor, you don't want to be in a position to give them any leverage. Um, so moving forward, my big, my big takeaways, check existing agreements. Are they targeted? Are they enforceable? And when I say audit, it doesn't require you necessarily bringing a third party and audit, but do a deep dive into how information flows within your organization. So you have a real good understanding of what, what's going on and whether the agreement that you have that was drafted in 2018, for, for instance, is still applicable to today. And with that, I'm told, thank you, Scott, we have five minutes, so just wanted to open up if anybody has any questions, whether on the Zoom or here, happy to answer it. And if you don't have questions now, but you have questions later, I left a, my contact information, so feel free to reach out, and I'll be around today, too, so happy to, happy to answer anything. I have a question about yes. Uh, the so you listed four states. I think I'm aware of eight or nine that have updated their laws in the last three or four years. And the comment was, you cannot just throw money at it. So if you have these non-competes that need to be updated and need to be addressed, and these are existing employees who are subject to this, and money isn't sufficient consideration for a new non-compete, what do you have to do? There's no additional information to give them. There's no new confidentiality. There's merely continued employment, which much, many states say is not sufficient new consideration. What do you have to do to change that and get new non-competes in place? Excellent question. So if, if I can distill it down a little bit and you tell me if I got this, my understanding of the question is, what is the type of consideration that you need to deploy to, for existing employees in order to ensure that you have an enforceable non-compete if you're trying to update it? Is that all right, so great question. And, and actually, there are some states, Tammy's absolutely right, generally speaking, you cannot just throw money at them, but there are actually some states where continued employment is okay. It just, it, it takes a state-by-state -state analysis. So um, if you're not giving any additional inf confidential information and you're not giving them additional trade secrets, you're absolutely right, you have to give something. That can be equity sometimes. If you're a publicly traded company, that's one way to look at it. Um, training is often, a viable means of consider a viable form of consideration. So that's one thing that I think you could look at the pretty low cost option potentially, um, especially if you haven't done training on what is tech. You know, it, it really and it really should be training tailored to what their job is. But um, that's one avenue to look at. I think equity training or two two areas you can look at. And there might be new and additional confidential information or trade secrets. If you're in a company that innovates a lot and is constantly coming up with new items and you've got a sales force, say, that's doing X, Y, Z, we want you to sell this new product, there's an opportunity there as well, I think. But equity would be seen as different from business. It can, yeah, in Texas it is. They, they will allow equity, like stock options and the like. I've even seen it with uh, closely held organizations, if it's like a partnership interest, um, you see that often with um, like limited partner, limited liability partnerships. I think we have one minute. So, does anyone have any other questions? Yes. Location is for. Uh, for the existing state laws, I mean, do they, do they go away or in, in a lot of cases the state law probably still applies? It's a great question. So you're facing there. So the question is what happens if one of these, if the current federal law becomes actual law? So it depends on how it's written, of course, whether preemption would apply. But um, the way that they have at least initially drafted it, I think you could see overnight a drastic shift or adjustment in existing non-compete agreements. But it would have to be in final form. and. I, and I would, insh I would bet every red cent that it would result in subsequent litigation and be, make its way up to the court. So I think I saw one, was there one more question or we good? Right on time. All right, well thank you, every much. thank you everybody, I really appreciate it.